Good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for listening to me today, and thank you very much for the invitation to speak. My name is Annika Hackenbroich, and I'm Vindolanda's Digitization Project Officer. Today, I'm going to talk about Vindolanda's collection of wooden artifacts, which are the main focus of the two-year funding from the Arts Council England. Before I go into more detail, I'd like to briefly explain the aims of the Digitization Project. To create a modern database for Vindolanda's wooden collection by inputting the collection into a fully digital database, including photography and 3D imagery. To enable volunteers to broaden their understanding of the wooden collection and enhance their skills. To make the wooden collection accessible to wider audiences. And to work closely together with partners from a range of universities. For today, I'm going to cover the following topics. The Vindolanda site and the preservation of wooden artifacts. Trees or no trees, tree covered during Roman times. Three examples of wooden artifacts. Volunteer engagement and visitor participation in the wood project during coronavirus. Let us start with some facts about Vindolanda for those who don't know it. Initially, Vindolanda was a conquest fort established in 8085, long before Hadrian's Wall was built. The forts in the new frontier zone were linked by the Stangate Road, which is its medieval name. The road linked military bases between Carlisle and Corbridge. Later, during the building of Hadrian's Wall, Vindolanda became a major construction base and formed part of the garrison after the wall was completed, even though it's some distance away from it. In periods when other forts along the wall were abandoned, Vindolanda was maintained as a strategic position. Looking at Vindolanda's position in the landscape, there would have been more pockets of woodlands that we see today. The ground would have been far more marshy and probably unsuitable for agriculture. The area was attractive for its mineral deposits and good water supply. Deposits of iron ore, coal, sandstone, limestone and even lead veins could be found. The production of mortar required lime and clay was needed for the packing of the wattle and daub walls. You still can see remains of the quarries on Barcombe Hill, which is here. Here you can see a brief overview of the garrisons that were stationed at Mendolanda. It demonstrates that the troops came from different parts of the empire. In addition, we get an idea of the impressive length of occupation over 400 years. In total, there were at least nine different forts at Vindolanda. This slide shows you the outlines of the forts during the first periods of occupation. These are the forts which are important for our topic today, because these are the layers where the organic artefacts can be found. The Vindolana Trust was founded in 1970 as a charitable organisation and runs excavations every year. Here are some pictures of the progress over the years. This picture was taken in 1969 and you can see the excavated headquarter building. This picture is from the 90s and I think you can see here already clearly excavations around the extramural settlement. This picture was taken in 2016 and I think you can see here an amazing progress over the years. Numerous wooden artefacts are on display throughout the museum and we have one gallery which exclusively displays wooden artefacts. The Wooden Underworld exhibition, which you can see here in the picture, was part of an HLF project. It opened in 2018 and if you haven't seen it yet, come along, it's really worth a visit like the rest of the museum. I started working for the Vindolana Trust just one day before lockdown last year. When measures started to ease, I was finally able to get my hands on the wooden collection. Having worked for museums along the German Lemurs, where organic finds can be rare and are often only related to wells, I'm even more amazed when looking at the wooden collection. And ask the question, why are the artefacts so well preserved? Like other organic material, wood is subject to attacks from various microscopic decay agents, such as yeast, fungi and bacteria. They colonize and feed on the organic material which forms the wood cells, such as cellulose and lignin. 
Therefore, survival of wooden artifacts is linked to an environment in which decay agents are starved of oxygen and warmth. An anaerobic environment can be created through waterlogging. In this process, the cell air is progressively replaced by water. The fungus isn't able to cross from cell to cell and growth is limited due to the lack of oxygen. Nevertheless, a waterlogged environment is not a guarantee of preservation of wood remains, as the soft rot fungus is able to survive without oxygen. Several circumstances need to come together for wood to survive. Looking at the situation at Vinolanda, four aspects in combination can be identified as being responsible for the well-preserved organic finds from the five pre-Hadrianic timber forts. If you have visited Vinolanda, you probably have experienced it can rain a lot, which is a positive because it keeps the soil wet and marshy. The site is close to numerous springs and it's possible that the water table has risen, which would add to the dampness of the area. Second, the process of demolition of successive buildings did not involve digging down into the foundations. After the removal of the sound timbers, the site was not cleared, but simply leveled and artifacts lost or discarded were left in place. Primary ditches were backfilled to allow the construction of buildings on top. Consequently, the stone foundations of the civilian buildings and the Severian fort protected the underlying timber. The surface was sealed with clay, with these multiple layers creating the anaerobic conditions in which the embedded material survived. One aspect that might have contributed to the preservation of the organic artifacts is that the timber buildings had floors made of hard packed clay, laminated with bracken, straw and mosses. The floor can be interpreted as a type of carpeting, a preventative measure against the damp conditions. After a period of time, a fresh layer would have been laid on top of it. The carpeting contains a wealth of everyday artifacts. Mosses and bracken have insecticidal properties and the presence of vivianite, an iron phosphate compound, has bacteriostatic effect. This slide gives an indication of the complex nature of the deposits at Vidolanda. You have to excavate up to seven meters below the present ground level to find the ground level from pre-Roman times. Here you can see an overview of the wooden small finds organized by tree type. And this raises the question of what the landscape looked like in Roman times. There is a controversy over what impact the Romans had on the tree cover in Britain. Yes, the early Roman forts in particular were built from timber and this would have had an impact on the landscape, but it's questionable whether this allows us to talk about a major timber clearance during Roman times. Looking at different sources, Trajan's column depicts tree felling as a major part of fort and camp building, which emphasizes the impact on the landscape. Caesar himself states in the conquest of Gaul that Britain contains every kind of timber, although archaeological evidence suggests that Caesar's expertise might not have been sufficient to identify tree species. Lucius Cassius Dio writes that Britons would withdraw into swamps and forests rather than engage directly with the Roman forces. Caesar also mentions extensive cereal growth in the southern parts of Britain. And Strabo refers to extensive Celtic fields. So in some ways we gain a picture of a mixed landscape. Looking at the written sources, it's difficult to distinguish fact from rumor. And there is a need to differentiate between the geographic areas in Britain. We can say for certain that a number of trees and tree species would have been different in Roman times. Northern local species would have been hawthorn, ash, birch, hazel, alder and oak, with oak being used for building structures and alder for water pipes. Fir and beech, both types found at Vinolanda, would not have been present in Northern Britain. They would have been imported as raw materials or finished objects. Some information on local tree cover can be derived from Vindolanda writing tablet 180. It mentions to the oxherd at the wood, which somehow implies that we are looking at a landscape with pockets of woodland. 
One way to gain scientific data is pollen analysis. Trees produce pollen every year and spread them across the landscape. If they fall onto marshy areas, they are preserved. Analysis does not provide information on precisely where the woodland was, but it indicates how open or closed a landscape was and the range of trees. Results suggest that woodland clearance in Northern Britain had already started in the Neolithic and Early Bronze Age. The landscape has already become more open and was followed by a significant clearance in the Iron Age around 400 BC, which was combined with woodland regeneration at the same time. Even if the picture is blurred, it suggests that Hadrian's Wall landscape had been fairly open before the Romans arrived. Land trees such as oak would still have been present in the landscape, but in general we are talking about pockets of woodland. Pollen analysis accumulated from two different ditches at Vinolanda, dating from 85 AD and 160 AD, undertaken by Adrian Manning, suggests that the immediate area around the ford had been cleared of all woodland before Hadrian's Wall was built in 122 AD. It is likely that the Roman landscape could be described as moorland, with isolated trees, pasture and arable land. Now let us have a look at Vindolanda's wooden artefacts. Vindolanda's collection holds in total 2,526 wooden artefacts. This figure doesn't include the Vindolanda writing tablets. Before we go into more detail, here are just a few examples to demonstrate the huge variety of wooden objects you can see at Vindolanda. The picture you see of the small turned box with lid shows a box which was made from box wood. These little boxes are also called pixies and would have been used to store cosmetics or medicine. The photo in the middle, which looks a little bit like a yo-yo, is a bobbin. It would have been used in textile production to store thread. Bobbins are a very common find in military camps and forts. They seem to have been an essential item of the Roman army. The domed outer part of the bobbin could have been used as something such as a darning mushroom we know nowadays. The bobbin as well was made from boxwood. In general, different tree types were used to produce bobbins. The last item you see is a bath clog made from alder. It would have been used in the Roman bathhouse to protect the wearer's feet from the hot floor due to the hypocaust. The bath clog here is missing its leather straps. For today, I picked the three wooden artefacts you can see here to look at in further detail. A comb, tent pegs and barrel staves. Coming originally from museums education, I'm in particular intrigued by wider narratives of museums artefacts. The well-known American heritage interpreter Freeman Tilden was right in saying, we connect with artefacts that relate to us, provoke us, or reveal something new to us. I am personally enthusiastic about artifacts that travel over distances. So I decided to choose two imported objects, the comb and the barrel staves, and one item probably made in Britain, the tent peg. The first one I would like to look at is the comb. Vendolanda has the largest comb collection in Britain. All are made from boxwood. The earliest known combs discovered in the Alps date from the Neolithic period and were made from boxwood, just like the Roman combs you find at Vinolanda. A sharp piece of flint was used to produce combs in the Neolithic era. During the Roman period, a very fine bladed saw or wire cut the teeth of a comb from a single blank of wood without any breakage. This is due to the peculiar properties of boxwood. It doesn't splinter and therefore won't catch hair. Boxwood seems to have been the material of choice for hair combs, although there is some evidence of other types of wood being used. Boxwood's natural habitat is the Mediterranean. It was known to thrive mainly in the Pyrenees. Boxwood grows slowly and 20 cm billets of boxwood are needed to produce a comb. The raw material must have been transported over long distances.
comes from the Windolander comb collection and comes from Saalburg in Germany shows similar types of carving, especially the one on the left. Which leads to the assumption there could have been a connection between places in relation to trade. Production sites were found in northern Italy and boxwood blanks have been excavated near Cologne, indicating a further production site in the Rhineland area. The H-shaped comb that you can see in the slide and you have seen before are also known as dust and knit combs and are a symbol of daily grooming. The comb would have had several functions such as disentangling uncombed human or animal hair to reduce the risk of infestation with fungus or lice. Cleaning. It is likely that hair washing wasn't taking place as frequently as nowadays. So the daily routine would have been to brush the hair. Water would have needed soap, but the fine teeth of the comb were able to remove soil and dust. This procedure would have cleaned the hair and would have got rid of dandruff as well. Even today, hairdressers state that hair combed and brushed doesn't need as much washing because the scalp will find its balance. Another aspect is nourishment. A variety of fats and oils such as olive oil and hog fat would have been used to make it shiny and combat hair loss. The comb could have been involved in spreading and applying of the different materials. One important aspect is lice removal. Head lice or knits were common during Roman times. Remains of knits, the head louse's eggs, have been found on excavated combs in Britain and on the continent. Lice control must have been one of the main jobs of the comb. The fine side would have been used to remove the knits, whereas the other side of the comb would have been used to brush and style the hair. The head louse thrives on a clean head because it needs access to the blood supply, so oily hair could have been seen as a protection. The head-shaped combs would have been found in every rank of society and been part of daily life. Wood would have been a lot cheaper than ivory or bone. Robin Burley suggested that even combs were used to comb animal hair after having found cow hair on a comb after excavation. Vinolana's combs show hidden details. Curator Barbara Burley discovered maker's marks on several combs which could have been applied with a metal dye. I hope you can see the maker's mark here. It's sometimes difficult to spot. Other hidden details that can be found on a comb are graffiti and small inscriptions where someone had written their name on the comb or just marked the comb to say maybe this is my comb and to mark the property. I hope you can see, I think it's easier to see here, that somebody has written their name on the comb. The maker's marks and the fact that the combs can be grouped in particular shapes and styles show that there was a trade network across Britain and the continent, as well as a level of craftsmanship behind comb making. Some wooden combs were produced in highly specialised workshops. Faber pectinarius is a Latin term for the comb maker, and it's likely that they produced wooden combs as well as ivory and bone combs in the same workshop. Commemorative funerary stele depict comb makers holding the comb maker's clam, the tool of their profession. There are several theories on how the combs were produced. A very fine saw was needed, or even a rough wire. Also, there are the suggestions that it would have been a double-bladed saw, which would explain the uniformity of the cuts. Now I would like to talk about another well-travelled category of objects, the staves or barrel pods. They certainly could have travelled many hundreds of kilometres before coming to Vindolanda. Vindolanda has a large quantity of barrel staves, predominantly made from larch or silver fur. For the production of barrels, cuprate was needed, which is the skill of producing barrels or casks which have the ability to hold liquid, for example wine. It is work which needs a lot of skill and training, and there must have been a huge demand for containers, barrels to transport goods such as pottery, food and wine throughout the empire. 
Let us say we want to follow the journey of a barrel and its staves. To do this, we need to start with the tree itself. Here you can see the distribution of European larch and silver fir today. The data was compiled in 2011. Archaeological evidence suggests that European larch and silver fir cannot be found in Britain during Roman times. So let us pick a stave, let's say one that is made from larch, and the original tree would have been somewhere in the Alps. So the Alps would be the starting point of our wooden object. Now we have started from the tree itself, maybe a large felt in the Alps. One single large tree might have been able to produce three large barrels. This means there needed to be enough supply, woodlands needed to be managed and people needed the skill and craftsmanship to produce them. The barrel would have been produced in several steps and the first journey of the barrel would have been possibly broken down into its component parts such as staves and hoops to make the transport of an empty barrel easier. Once our barrel is finished by a cooper and filled, we turn to the navigable rivers as important transport routes across the empire. So it is likely that Vindolanda staves had originally been put on a boat as barrels and transported by a river to a seaport. Barrels were valuable items, so once empty, they would have been refilled, which could have happened several times, and there is evidence that the Romans tried to repair them as much as possible to protect their investment. After a long journey, the barrel would cross the English Channel and maybe arrive in Londinium. There is evidence that a cooper was based in Londinium and maybe his job was to repair broken barrels. Another route of travel would be up the coast and up the River Tyne, finishing its journey on the Stangate Road and finally arriving at Vendolanda. Some of the barrels can actually tell us a lot about their journey through brands and marks applied to them on the route. One example you can see here in the slide. Once in Vindolanda and empty, the barrels beyond reuse would have been recycled in many different ways, or finally been used as fuel. Here are a few examples of reuse. Some barrels were recycled as open top tubs or other containers. The tubs could have been used for tanning leather, or other sites report that they found staves which indicate horses having chewed the edges. So the barrels could have become actually horses troughs. Here you can see two further examples of recycling from Vindolanda. The example here in the middle is a stave that finally became a floorboard. And the other example that you can see here is a stave that finally became a window frame. I hope I was able to prove that a barrel stave can have an exciting life and a great story to tell. During the process of going through the collection, there was one item that especially caught my eye, and that was a tent peg. Yes, an ordinary object and maybe not special, but the wooden object in my hand made me think back to my last attempt to pitch a tent on the shores of Stihead Tarn in the Lake District in the middle of winter. We had underestimated the conditions and had to abandon the plan to pitch our tent after losing those essential pegs in the snow. An experience we certainly share with the Romans. It always makes me smile to imagine what a Roman soldier would think if he were able to see me handling so carefully his discarded peg. A peg he probably thought expendable. Nevertheless, I can also imagine a Roman soldier crawling around in the dark trying to find the missing peg. A tent peg can't be looked at in isolation from another organic find, the tent itself. Tents have been prominent symbols of the Roman army. A camp would have been the first step to permanent occupation. It is the essence of a mobile army unit. Tents have been important not only to operations far away from the fort, but also to help with the transition from a temporary marching camp to the construction of a permanent fort. At this stage, I should mention Trajan's column again which is a major source of information on a Roman soldier's life and depicts a variety of tents. In the foreground are the commander's tents and in the background smaller rectangular and bivouac tents, one-man tents, which would have belonged to the lower ranks. The leather tents appear to have a box frame construction with a low pitched roof and a deep overhang, made of leather rectangles as are the walls. The column also shows the transport of bundle tents carried by boat. 
Looking at other sources, a text by an anonymous author from the 2nd century AD describes how tents were pitched in orderly rows. A 10-foot tent with 2-foot long guy rows would provide a sheltered contubernium for 8 men and some space for their baggage. The centurion would have had a similar tent all to himself. Finds from excavation at Vindolanda are providing clues to construction methods and sizes of Roman tents. More than 50 tent pegs and several pieces of leather have been excavated over the years. One exciting aspect of the several pieces of leather discovered was that the team realized that by fitting the individual stitch holes together, they had discovered an almost complete tent. After extensive sorting, four large panels, smaller panels and further assorted pieces were identified as parts of a single tent. The find of a nearly complete tent helped to draw further conclusions on how the tents were pitched. Before the find, the assumption was that a central pole and the guy ropes would have held up the tent. This, however, couldn't be confirmed, taking into account the considerable weight of the leather, which would have been even greater in wet conditions. The strain would have been too much for such a simple frame. The weight of the leather walls suggested that every tent would have needed a wooden frame and probably four guy ropes would have been used as support holding the leather down over the frame, pegged out about 30 centimeters from the wall. Vertical posts at the corners with horizontal poles would have been necessary to bear the weight of the roof. Unfortunately, none of the surviving tent panels have loops for pegging, so the mud wall and the very poor preservation of lower panels suggests earth may have been heaped up against them. The guy ropes were tied directly through the reinforced eyelets on the wall. It is likely that toggles were used for fastening the door at the either end. Vindelana's wooden artifact need to be further investigated to establish whether we have pieces of a wooden tent frame. There was one wooden artifact which could be interpreted as a tensioner. The Vindolana tent is of high quality and gives the impression that the stitching must have been carried out by professionals while later repairs would have been done by the soldiers themselves. 75 skins were required to produce one tent. Goat skin was used for most of the military equipment because it's lighter than calf and has a higher tensile strength. The tent would have had a weight of around 18 to 20 kilogram. By comparison, a cowhide would have weighed around 30 kilogram. It's estimated that a tent would have lasted approximately 10 to 20 years. The cost for the communal tent was shared between eight soldiers and taken from their pay, which makes it even more likely that they would have wanted to maintain the tent and make it last. Military registers show that the mother of a dead soldier received 20 denarii as a refund for his share of a tent. It is likely that the tents were manufactured in the legionary fortresses and taken to auxiliary forts for use on campaign. The cutting of the individual tent panels might have been undertaken by unskilled workers following a template and a modular system to avoid any waste of leather, with the actual stitching being done by professionals. I decided to leave the tent pegs until last because it leads nicely into volunteer and visitor engagement. When I spoke to the volunteers about the idea of having a closer look at Vindolanda pegs, it turned out we'd all had adventures with these ordinary objects and we started a small research project looking in detail at Vindolanda pegs. What we discovered about the pegs at Vindolanda is they are made from billets of radially split oak, the radial split giving a stronger result than an oblique section. The Romans would have used trunks or large bunches of wood. If you compare the pegs you can see in the slide, they all have similar general shape to fulfill their common function. They have slightly different shaped heads, cross sections and tips, lead to the conclusion that several hands were involved in the production and which didn't need to be highly skilled. One tree would have been enough to produce hundreds of tent pegs. It is easy to assume that the Romans might have used whatever wood and timber was available when they needed it. However, there are contemporary written sources which provide evidence that the Romans had a wide knowledge of the suitability of individual tree species. Theophrastus even attributed properties of the elements to different tree species. Earth was attributed to oak, 
for robustness, easy to split, and expands in the earth when wet. Looking at the Vindolanda tent pegs, it is noticeable that they are slim and short. Compared to tent pegs from other Roman sites such as Carlisle, Melander, Unterschwaningen or Saalburg in Germany. Vindolanda pegs are around 25 cm long, whereas pegs from other forts range from 30 to 45 cm. Carlisle and Melandra have pegs which haven't been used and were found predominantly in the ditches. At Vindolanda, they were found in the ditches, but also spread out a lot more over the site, such as floors, commanding officers' house, water tank, etc. Carlisle pegs show hardly any signs of use. For the pegs at Vindolanda, both unused and used pegs were found. All the ten pegs found from all the different sides have pointed heads. Unused ten pegs are common and a bit of a puzzle. They could have been surplus and been discarded or lost. There is an assumption that unused slim ten pegs could have been an offcut left over from the splitting of other pegs from a block. A study from the Netherlands goes so far as to question whether some of these are ten pegs at all or rather a part of some item of furniture. A fort in Denmark shows tenpeg-like artefacts as caltrops in the surrounding ditches of the fort, which you can see here in the slide. This could be an explanation why we find unused tenpegs in ditches. The Milandra field group carried out a number of experiments to determine how tenpegs might have been made, at Vindolanda, we decided to do something similar. We invited Kevin Robson of Ancient Britain, who owns a reconstruction of a Roman tent, and we asked him to produce tent pegs just like our real artifacts, and we decided to test them. Kevin used an axe instead of the hook and mole, and was able to produce pegs very quickly. The Melandra field group had used the hook and mole. Afterwards, we wanted to find out if the pegs actually work on the replica tent. Our answer was yes, they do. But what always puzzled us were the pointed heads. We couldn't think of an explanation why the pegs have pointed heads, although we didn't test how flat-headed pegs would behave. The Sand Christmas lecture provided a very likely answer. I was contacted after the lecture, which I highly appreciate, and someone demonstrated to me what happens to flat-headed tent pegs. As you can see here in the picture, they break because of the distribution of the forces. After having spent a morning with Kevin looking at and pitching his tent and watching him producing tent pegs, we organized a small COVID secure event on Roman camp life for the public in September 2020. Kevin and one other reenactor came to set up tent, produce pegs and talk about food and military equipment. In addition, the volunteers and I offered an opportunity to see and handle original tent pegs and leather. The handling experience was made possible by passing new gloves to every participant. The work undertaken in relation to the tent pegs was highly supported by the museum's volunteers, and I couldn't have done it without them. Which brings me to my next point. As already mentioned, I started to work at Vindolanda on the 22nd of March 2020. I saw my office chair and sat in it for one day before leaving it for seven months as the world went into lockdown. Having volunteer engagement and visitor engagement as one of the project aims seemed to be unachievable, considering the fact that the volunteers didn't know me and I didn't know them yet. In an ideal world, it would have been an advantage to work with the volunteers from the beginning, but this couldn't be changed. When lockdown started to ease, I went into the museum twice a week to work on tasks that cannot be done from home. And at this point, I saw the collection for the first time. The trust undertook a survey of staff and volunteers to see how we felt about returning to work. It became clear that it is important to strike a balance between being safe and being able to go out and do things for your own well-being. Volunteering and working is not just about the content of work, it is also about the social interaction. With this strong indication from the survey, the objective was to bring a few volunteers back and to be able to work on the project. We are very fortunate to have very wide open spaces here at Vindolanda. I have plenty of space in my office and the collection store is an open area. In addition, we have plenty of outdoor space to have breaks in. 
We decided to bring back five volunteers and team them up in social bubbles, staggering days so as to not have everyone in at the same time. This enabled us to start working on the wood database, condition checking and adding to the already comprehensive data on the wooden artifacts, which will be transferred into the museum's database program collection index plus, and ultimately will make the collection searchable online. As already mentioned, we were able to start the 10 pack research project and undertake a COVID secure event on Roman Camp Live. We also were able, as already mentioned, to undertake some experimental archaeology. The Vindulana Trust in general developed a wide range of online material and online content, such as blogs and short films, as part of the Global Vindulana project. Please have a look at the website if you haven't seen it yet. Another challenge was to try a 3D scanning of several wooden artifacts as part of the project. We started to liaise with various partners, but as you can imagine, scanners were locked up in buildings and had not been used for a while. Many people were working from home without access to equipment and a whole new procedure of risk assessment had to be put in place for anyone needing to visit us. Once we finally managed to have someone coming out to us, we realized that a scanner was broken. One of those random issues to be dealt with when working with high-end technologies. Thanks to Teesside University, we were able to do some trials, with the result that some wooden artifacts, such as bath clogs, turned objects, are scanning really well. But the scanner wasn't able to pick up the fine teeth and delicate te details of the combs that I've mentioned earlier. Whereas traditional photography can. This shows even more how important it is to think about why you scan and actually what you scan. We came to the conclusion that we will use both. 3D scan and traditional photography. As you will know, there was not just one lockdown. Working with the collection and the volunteers activity came to a hold again. We were able to continue work on the database from home. The volunteers wrote blogs based on their experience with the project and other topics. And we had and have virtual meetings every Wednesday between the volunteers and me to keep us all together, so to speak. Nevertheless, COVID has given us time to think about how can we engage with an audience when that audience cannot visit or isn't even allowed to travel. My current activities as we come out of this current lockdown sees me working with the team at Bundelanda to develop an online exhibition. I'm excited that it will be co-curated by a wide range of the Bundelanda team members, front of house collection and operation staff and volunteers. In addition, we will liaise with the Board of Trustees, an expert from Teesside University and University College Dublin. In a change of emphasis, the exhibition will approach wooden artifacts from a personal and emotional viewpoint, such as, I connect with this artifact because it reminds me of, it fascinates me. The results of the display will depend on whatever the participants choose ranging from videos, photo collages, creative writing, short drama scenes, etc. I'm looking forward to seeing how it develops over the coming weeks. It will be a chance to show what encountering these amazing objects, however humble and ordinary, does to you, me and everyone who sees them. These almost 2000 year old pieces of everyday life that really shouldn't still exist, but do. Rare glimpses of that Roman past. Thank you very much for your attention. I would like to give special thanks to Rob Sands from the University College in Dublin for his advice and knowledge and letting me use some of the content that he hasn't published yet. The Vindolanda site opened on the 29th of March and excavation has already started as well. If everything goes to plan, the museum will open on the 17th of May. Please see my bibliography here. If you would like the list of the bibliography, please email me at anikehackenbroich at windelanda.com.